couple of announcements before Pastor John comes, and that is um, on April 22nd, we're going to be having our ladies' meeting here. I'm going to try, you know, Bobby, I was just thinking about it. I think I'm going to try to get the, I think I'm going to try to get it here at the Sacama Club because we're doing painting and we're doing, uh, we're putting pots together with soil and then we're having a Bible study as well. So I'm going to ask them if we can have it here. And then Pastor John will let you know when your next men's meeting is. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm gonna, not going to disclose that right now. No, okay, so we'll get, if you're not on, if you don't see Bobby's uh, messages on Facebook, let her know so she can contact you. And then also, I just want to let you guys know a little heads up. My mom's church is having um, a, a, a little ladies conference on May 7th, um, and Diane Goodman, Vestal and Howard Goodman's daughter-in-law, um, is going to be there speaking that night. So that's May 7th. It's, um, I believe it's a uh, Saturday don't quote me, but look at th look that up. But May seventh, and um, I was just thinking, any ladies that want to go from our church to um, to see her that night, she was given a time frame to live. They told her she only had um, cer a certain amount of days to live, and God healed her body. And she's going to tell that testimony. And uh, she's just a precious woman of God, Vestal's um, daughter-in-law. So anybody that would like to go. I'm just opening that up to you, and we'll put that on the calendar as well. But I just think it would be a nice time to um, hear her because she's just a sweet, pr her and Rick, their son, are just precious, precious people, and I just think you'd enjoy that. But, yes, I'm excited about, I'm going to ask the Sacrament Club if the ladies can be here that night for the 22nd. It's Earth Day, and we're doing pots. Uh, we're planning, and we're painting, and we're also going to have a Bible study that night. So I think we'll probably just do something simple like pizza, so it won't be any big thrown out thing, but maybe just something quick and easy as far as food goes. But looking forward to that, looking uh, very forward to that. And I uh, just want you to know that um, God's moving. We've had a couple healings here the last couple weeks. Pat Piccarelli came in two weeks ago, two Sundays ago, and she said when she came, she said when she came in, she said her knee knees were better. She said my knees today are pain free. Yeah, she said she was pain free for the first time in a long time. And then last week when we were taking communion, um, Selena got healed of, she had been congested for a couple weeks and she got, she was totally free of her congestion. She said, I thought for, I thought I was. And she goes, I got in my car and she goes, I knew that I was. So praise the Lord. We're just looking forward to every week, something happening, people getting saved, people getting healed, bodies being free, and also living financially victoriously in Jesus name. You know, God doesn't want you poor. He doesn't want you, he doesn't want you uh, needy, but he wants you to be able to be a blessing. When he told Abraham, he said, go out to a country that you don't know. He said, and I'm going to make you be a blessing. He said, I'm going to cause you to be blessed. I'm going to cause you to inherit the uh, people as your descendants. And not only that, but he was a wealthy man. And God wants you to be blessed. So what? So you can consume it on your own less? No. So you can bless others. You're blessed to be a blessing. And I know everyone in this church has a heart to give. And I've seen that. And I've, th I've seen the fruit of it. And I just thank, you know, the Bible says, or I've heard this all my life, that you can't outgive God. And that's really true. When you give to him, God will pour out blessings upon you. So Pastor John's coming. Again, we're so excited to have Uncle Jake with us. Uh, his <laughs> Uncle Jake's here today. We're so glad that he's here. If you were, you came in late, and uh, we're so glad that he's here today. God bless you. We love you. Amen. You want to power that off, James? All right. Am I live? I got my sport coat over there. I just can't do it this morning. I'm nice and, and comfortable. But I got so much I want to say this morning. I mean, it's amazing. So much that God wants to share. And we've got a limited time to get it done. And uh, as Selena prays every week, you know, if I can just get out of my own way and let God be God, we're going to have a good time. Amen. So you need to get your expectation up this morning. And, um, you know, I've really become aware in the last couple weeks of there's a there's a way that we pray that's in air church. I hate to say it, and a lot of our praise and worship songs, they, 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 they sound good, but they don't line up with what the Bible says. We pray, and we, we you know, it, who's ever been in a prayer meeting where we, we just pray, God, pour out Your Spirit, rend the heavens and come down. He did. <laughs> he 
did come down. He did. You know, that was an Old Testament. You say, well, well, David prayed these things. Yeah, he did. But David was an Old Testament man. Mark's here. All right. Mark's my drumming, my my drummerless, my drum drum drummerless drummer. That we're going, we got to fix that situation, right, Leo? We 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 need our percussion back. We got some songs ready, but let's not get away from that. We prayed, Father God, send down. Your, do you know the Holy Spirit is a hitchhiker on the inside of you? We've, we've, we feel so powerless and we say, God, I can't do anything. You know, you know that we can do nothing and we feel so helpless when we ask for, we ask for anything. We ask for finances. We ask for healing in our bodies. And we say, God, I'm powerless and I can do nothing. Well, that's true. Apart from God, you can do nothing. But how many of you know that you are never apart from God? You say, I'm just a man. I'm just flesh and blood. That's not true. On the inside, you are wall-to-wall carpeted Holy Ghost. He lives on the inside of you. And Uncle Jake would help if you'd smile at me and tell me I'm doing a little better than your... Than your... <laughs> Two stars. Well, we, got, we got room for improvement. Church, you need to understand God has set up residence on the inside of you. We're not going to talk... You know, we've been on this healing is here for... Four out of the five, last five weeks, and I'm taking a week off. I got a brand new message for you this morning that it's about faith. And if you, you know, if you don't want to be healed, that's up to you. But I'm going to take all I can get. We're not begging God to get healed anymore. We need to start taking the attitude. Whatever you need this morning, come in here. It's free. It's free. We're watching that um, internship Google movie, Owen Wilson and and what's his Vince Vaughn or whatever Vaughn and. And, they, and Google, he comes up to the, the counter and he's like, everything's free. And I, everybody know, ever seen that scene? And he's like, well, I'll take eight bagels then. It's, he said, they're still free. Oh, he says, well, you know, I really should, you know, I need my, my potassium. And, and, and he says, it's free. And he's almost ashamed that he's taking this stuff at the same time. If it's free, take it. Do you know, in the kingdom of God, everything is free? You should be smiling about that. Everything is free. We need to get away from this mentality that we're poor beggars and we're coming in. I I can picture God up in heaven and He is elbowing Jesus. He said, didn't you tell them? Didn't you tell them that your presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit, didn't you tell them I am going to send another comforter to take up residence on the inside of you? You are never apart from God. He is with you every place you go. 24 hours a day. And if you're sick in your body, I know Jesus does not want to live in a beat up, broken down old apartment. He wants your body healthy and whole. Some of you haven't received healing just because you haven't gotten that settled in your heart and your mind yet. We're not going there this morning, but we have been on the number one essential for healing is what? Believing that it is God's will for you to be healed. You're not sitting and waiting for a bus that may or may not be coming. I hope I'm hope I'm at the right bus stop at the right time. God's will is for you to be healed in Jesus' name. Amen? That's a great place to say amen. So I want to... Julie, I sh- messed up already. It's important that we get these handed out. And I'm, my sermon, I'm not going to reveal the sermon title to you right now, but you need, you need this popcorn this morning. All right, you hang on to that, and hopefully, God willing, if we get there between now and three o'clock, when we usually end, Uncle Jake, and um, <laughs> come on now, let's get this moving. Ace will help you, and everybody's got it. You gotta have, you gotta have some popcorn. But there's a there's a joke I want to share with you, and it's one of my. He doesn't know he's one of my mentors, but uh, Mark Hankins, Hankins from Alexandria, Louisiana. One of the uh, ministers that I listen to who's helped me tremendously, he shared his, one of his daddy, this is my daddy's favorite joke. Okay, I know you're all engrossed in your popcorn right now. So, But um, he says, this is Mark Hankins' uh, dad's favorite joke. He says, this man, he says, he got in trouble, got in trouble with the law, and he, he had to go to court and stand before the judge, and the judge asked him, he said, uh, son, he says, what is your name? He said, the man responded, he said, my name is Joshua. And the judge said, Joshua, huh? He said, like Joshua in the Bible that made the sun stand still? He said, no, your honor. He said, I'm Joshua that made the moon shine. (laughs) 
That's Mark Hankins' daddy's favorite joke, and that's funny, I don't care what you say. <laughs> this service today, I want to talk to you about the spirit of faith. Come on now, you'd be excited. God's got something good for you today. If you're just willing to receive it and get your heart wrapped around it and receive it, it'll be yours. I didn't say that. God said that. Talk about the spirit of faith. And as we've said week after week, you can apply this to whatever you need. You need healing in your relationships. You need finances for your life, a new job. You need healing in your body. You use this without faith, it's impossible to please God. Is that because God is this horrible taskmaster that this is the way it's going to be? No, because God knows that you need faith for everything in your life that he wants to get to you. It's going to require faith to have it. So you want to be pleasing to God. Learn how to operate in faith. Amen? 2 Corinthians. I see nobody brought their Bibles. Nobody brings Bibles anymore. I, I have my Bible. Asa says, I've defy you i have a bible i've heard several men of god talk about you know they get so upset and uh, see these people sitting there playing with their phones and they're actually reading the bible i shared one of my co-workers the other day i said i've got i've been taking my holy scriptures i got 51 scriptures that i'm taking every day and i started to open my phone and he says i thought you were going to talk about the bible i said i am pete it's right here and i scrolled down and had all my scriptures in my phone Thank you, man, isn't technology something? We can look at our cam- <laughs> iPad. We, we got it going on. Our scripture this morning is 2 Corinthians 4 and 13. It says, um, and remember, we're going to look at how faith works. Say that with me. How faith works. This is good information because if your faith had not been working for you, you're going to learn something this morning that's going to change that. Turn that around so that your faith, that the faith that you apply is effectual and starts to have a desirable result for you. These being the words of Paul, he said, we, and I will to explain this scripture in a minute. He said, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. In other words, Paul was saying, he said, we having, I already say, I already got it. I already got it. We having the same spirit of faith. He uses another term here, same. Same as who? (laughs) We have this faith that's the same. Same as what, Mary? Same as whose faith? Well, we had to do a little research and find out who he is talking about here. He says, according as it is written. So this same spirit of faith, Mark, has already been written down somewhere. So if you're an investigative Bible reader, you'll go back and say the words that he spoke here must be written somewhere else. And who spoke these words? Paul is quoting the psalmist David. Everybody knows King David, right? The boy with his slingshot and the the big guy. David had already said, I believe and therefore... Have spoken. He also goes on to say, I was greatly afflicted. In the middle of affliction, David says, I have this spirit of faith. I believed and therefore have spoken. David goes on. Here's what David said. He said, the Lord has delivered my life from death. And my eyes, this is Psalm 116 and 8, if anybody's jotting this down to, to read later. He said, you've delivered my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. In other words, David is saying these three things. The spirit of David, his heart cries out, I'm not going to die, but I'm going to live. You've delivered me from death. I'm not going to keep crying anymore. I'm going to be happy. Some of you are not ready to be happy yet, obviously, but... We've got time. And he said, I'm not going to keep crying. I'm going to be happy. And then he finally says, you're going to keep my feet from falling. Whether you say it outwardly or say it inwardly or get an agreement with me. Say, I am not going to keep stumbling over the same stumbling blocks any longer. I have a beautiful mind and I am not as dumb as I appear. And I do. I am a fast learner. 
And just because you mess up doesn't mean that it's over for you. And I'm not going to stumble, and I'm not going to fall, and I'm going to get happy, and I'm not going to cry anymore. And the devil's not taking me out of here before I fulfill my days and my destiny on this earth. Guaranteed, amen? So when Paul says, we having the same, you're with me now? When he says, we having the same spirit of faith, he's referring to the psalmist David. David had the spirit of faith. David had it when he was 17 years old. He killed Goliath when he was just a young teenager. So there's no, Noah get encouraged. There's no age limit on the spirit of faith. Is it man, pastor's talking to me now? Yes, pastor is talking to you. You know, it's something I've learned in ministry. And I, you know, we've been at Faith Life Church will, will be six years old next month. Six years we've been pulling this plow, making this happen. And last year, our church got turned upside down, and now we're portable, and we move in and out, and I like we're a militia on the move. Gypsies. Thank you. I'll get some. <laughs> so one thing I've learned, and I, in my youth, I thought everybody came to church wanting to be helped. And I have found out people don't really want to be helped. They want to come here as a service to God and everything be okay in their life and not be changed. And as long as I sit in this seat, everything's okay. And I thought everybody wanted to be helped. People don't want to be helped. For the most part, people don't want to be changed. If you will open up your heart and your life to be changed, you'll be amazed at what God is willing to do. God revealed some things to me yesterday as to why I'm dealing with some of the things, the physical things hurdles that I've been dealing with and I won't disclose any more than that but pastor's been he's been he's been on it I've been to more doctors in the past three months than I have in my entire life and God revealed something to me John that was one of the reasons why I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with and if I hadn't heard what I heard ministered earlier in the week it would have been overwhelming to me because you think oh my gosh one more reason why I'm in this mess when God, when, when God uses the word of God, or God, you know, in lieu of my, in, in spite of myself, when God uses me to minister to you, I am not condemning you. I'll be honest with you. I never close line preach. I never try and like, well, this is good for Viv, and you know, this is. I never do that. But when God reveals something from this pulpit, I am not condemning you. God is not condemning you. The Holy Ghost is convicting you. And when you figure out, they bring some fresh... When it gets real quiet, and I find, that's usually when I get right where I'm supposed to be. When you can hear a pin drop and people are looking at me with gate, like laser beams wishing they could burn a hole in me and shut me up. I'm right where I need to be. You ought to rejoice because God just revealed to you what the problem is. We start talking about, you know, most or at least half of the healings that Jesus performed involved demon spirits. And if I say to you, you got a demon in your flesh, you want to crawl out of the church backward and head out that back door because we are so ashamed that I can have a, it's a demon, I have a demon in my flesh. You ought to rejoice that God just revealed to you what the problem is. Demons are easy to deal with. Tell them to get out in Jesus' name. It's you that's the problem. You're the one that's hard to deal with. Demons are easy. I'm the only one that liked that this week. I can, I can tell. God revealed some things to me yesterday that if I hadn't had that pre-knowledge on the front side, it would have been overwhelming to me. Selena, I had to bawl my eyes out. I thought, I'm just an unworthy rag and I'm never going to get this right. You know, you got to love yourself. You know, you got to like you. And when you don't like you, sooner or later your body's going to get in line with what you really feel. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And you'll bring and reap Sickness and disease on your own body if you don't like you. Some people have a problem with that. I don't care who's loved you or didn't love you in the past or who's sang your praises or who ran your flag up the flagpole. and It doesn't matter. I wrote down five scriptures today on a piece of notebook paper. I'm focusing on, I've been looking at healing and God said, you need to turn your attention to my love for you. 
how much I love you. You know, John 3, 16, God so loved the world. You need to erase world and put God so loved Andy and Fess and Bobby. You need to insert your name in there and take it out of this world equation because it's personal. And I got to move because I got a lot. I got to get to this popcorn. And there's so many things I want to say. You asked for this, and now you're getting it. He's telling me, wing it, Pastor. Get off them notes. You're, you're getting exactly what you asked for. David had this, this, the spirit of faith. I want you to know, on the flip side, Joshua and Caleb, Julie named two rabbits after Joshua and Caleb when she was a young teenage girl. Joshua and Caleb, I cannot think of those two now and not think about these bunnies. Joshua and Caleb had the spirit of faith when they, Leo, when they were 80 years old. Deuteronomy 13 and 30, it's up in my, my room there under one of the front windows. We are well able to possess the land. 80 years old, and they, Uncle Jake, there's time for you. He, you're, you're still a pup. We are well able to possess land. So whether you're seven, 17 or 78, it doesn't matter. You can have the spirit of faith. You may not be as talented or educated or as beautiful as in your own thought process as somebody else, but you can have the spirit of faith that will make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Paul said, we having, we have it. David had it. Take a second to identify with that. We have the same spirit of faith. You have it. You're not waiting for it. It's not coming. It's here. Healing is here we have been engrossed air thinking we're waiting for something that's not that's that's out there that's coming over and over again since my youth we every prophecy is you know if you'll do this god will do that and this day will be here and we've we've done that in air you want god to move start putting his name and his word on the line we have been experiencing healings minor healings but i'm telling you the best is yet to come. Amen? Because I'm not surprised at all. You can't, you can't minister the word and it not be fulfilled. God's word will not return void. So I'm going to take you kicking and screaming through health and healing and faith, whether you like it or not. I'm expecting good things. That doesn't mean I'm sitting there like a frog on a log waiting for it to happen. It's already here. We're going to act in faith and see it manifest. Amen? So, David had the spirit of faith. How can you, do you agree? David had the spirit of faith. How can you tell? Well, let's look at his resume. He killed a lion and a bear before he killed Goliath. He might have been 13 or 14 years old. Noel, do you think you'd like to tangle with a, with a, a bear, a grizzly bear or a lion? The spirit of faith, if God be for us, who can be against us? You don't, you don't tackle these mountains. You don't tackle these situations in your own right. You do it with a pure, righteous heart. God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There's no cancer, there's no sickness or disease that can defeat you because God lives on the inside of you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You need to believe that. He killed Goliath when he was about 17 years old. You know, the story goes, Goliath said he stormed around and he says, who will fight me? And David spoke. Goliath spoke. David said. Goliath said. David ran. David struck him in the forehead and Goliath didn't say nothing else. Never let the devil have the last word. Never let the devil have the last word. I said last week, I shared that scripture that casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 or something. Definitely 2 Corinthians 10, Mark. Cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You're only going to be as strong as your knowledge of God. The word of God that you know. The kids have been standing with Julie and I. I asked Cole, I said, I, I said, are you in agreement with mom and dad for whatever's going on in dad's body? He goes, yes. I said, what do you base that on? He couldn't give me a straight answer yesterday. And I said, buddy, I said, what's your scripture? Well, then he spit one out for me. I said, just believing is, is good, 
And it's nice, it looks good, but it's not, effect, it's not effectual, it's not effective. Your faith needs to be substantiated and based upon God's Word. That's the promise. So whatever it is you need in life, Cole's thing, you know, you know he's, a, he's a good tennis player and he's trying to develop into a better tennis player, but he's had some issues when he gets out on the court. And I may know that when it's game time, Noah, all of a sudden, that basketball from the free throw line with seconds left in the game and the ball, you know, ball's in your hand and you have a chance to ice this thing, to seal the deal, that hoop gets smaller and that ball gets heavier. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, you stand on that foul line, you say, God has not given me a spirit of fear but one of power and of love and a sound mind. It has helped Cole tremendously. He is something. And we're excited for him, and it's great to everything. You know, we're talking about sports. Yeah. God lives on the inside of you. He does care. Never let the devil have the last word. And you may not hear him in an audible voice, but when he whispers in your ear that you will die and not live, you say, no, no, no. My scripture says that I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Revelation 12, 11, we have overcome him by the blood of the lamb and what? The word of our testimony. What does that mean? You got to wait until you got a doctor's report that says you're well? No. I've been flabbergasted to people at work. Well, how you doing, John? I said, I believe I'm healed in Jesus' name. And they don't know what to say. I have offered to pray for people and they go on talking like I didn't even speak to them. And that's okay. I take that as they don't want me to pray for them. I said, I don't have to be ignorant. I don't have to be abrasive. We saw our cousin Aunt Joan. Cousin Aunt. She's mom's cousin. She's our aunt. Aunt Joan Tiedman in in, uh, the Orient Restaurant last night. Took my mom and dad out. It was mom's, my mother's 60, your sister's 69th birthday, April 7th. Took them out last night, and um, we bump into Aunt Joan, and Aunt Joan has been dealing with uh, s- multiple sclerosis symptoms for some time now, and she went into a remission for several years, and now in her you know, late 70s, it's tried to resurface, and she looked at me, she says, well, John, how are you doing? I said, I said, I'm healed in Jesus' name, Aunt Joan. I said, will you be my prayer partner? And before she could answer, I had my hand on the sides of her head, and I said, with what, everything that's in me, I give to you in Jesus' name. Right there, in the, right there in the front row at the Orient Restaurant, right at the counter. I didn't even look around to see what anybody else thought because you know what? I don't care. I don't care. We serve a healing Jesus. Amen? So never let the devil have the last word. David won the war of words before he won the fight of faith. And you need to do the same thing. That's our model. With the spirit of faith, we must believe and therefore speak. That needs to be reiterated. The spirit of faith, we having the same spirit of faith, have believed and therefore speak. Paul said it, David said it. That's how God had built everything that you see around with the same spirit of faith. First, we must believe and then speak. Paul says we have the same spirit of faith. It doesn't mean you're not going to have any trouble. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers, the Lord delivers him out of them all. It's chapter and verse, right? David and Paul, both of them were able to demonstrate and maintain the same spirit of faith in adversity. Believing and speaking, listen to me, church, opens the door to the supernatural. That's how you do it. If you're taking notes, that's a good thing. Believing and speaking opens the door to the supernatural. I would recommend reaching out by your faith and believing God to get healed of the common cold so that when the report of cancer or some other ooh, horrible thing comes, that it's nothing but just another thing. David said, I killed a lion and a bear, and I will take Goliath down as well. I think running noses and little things that are just inconveniences, they're lions and bears in our life. And then these horrible reports that come that you're not going to live very long and your days on this earth will be short or Goliath-type problems in our life. And then when we've defeated the lion and the bear, it will be no different. It will be no different. 
Believing and speaking opens the door to the supernatural. When you open the door to the supernatural, I want you to understand this. This is vitally important that you get this. You are the believer. You are the speaker. God is the performer. Church, you don't, you're never desperate. You are never desperate. You don't act in desperation. The Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. He is with you, taking up residence on the inside of you. He is the performer. Your job is to believe and speak. When I first got these reports, I mean, I'm just frantic. Like, I can't get word in me, coming out of me, in me, writing it down fast enough. And I'm like, you know what? God is the performer. You only need one scripture passage. That's all you need. That's all you need. He put it in the Old Testament and the New Testament for you. Isaiah 53, 5, and 1 Peter 2, 24. God is the performer. God will show up right in the midst of your believing and your speaking. It'll happen. Just rest in it. Mountains will be removed. In the middle of adversity, he'll make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. This scripture is um, one that we should be aware of. Proverbs 24.10 says, if you, if, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. I don't want to be known as a weak person. I shared something with one of Julie's co-workers. She's dealt with a eye surgery. She had a turned-in eye since her, since her birth, and here she is now in her mid-40s, and she finally had the courage to have the surgery. And her eyes are straight, but how many know that when you have seen cross-eyed for 45 years that her brain still sees things differently? And she's going through the process of training her body, and she's getting weary. She's tired of going to therapy sessions and getting up in the morning and not seeing things clearly. And I shared with her back years ago, I did that message on um, Marcus Luttrell's story, the sole survivor, the Navy SEAL that was the four-man SEAL team, and he's the only one that made it out alive. And I remember some information that he had shared that some drill sergeant had told him about getting through, they call it Hell Week. You know, like 135 Navy SEALs start their training and about six or eight actually make it through what's going to separate you and make you one of the six and this guy said marcus he says don't ever look at hell week as the whole week he says because you'll never make it he said focus on the task at hand don't get caught up and how many more years of this school do i have to do now to get to where i would like to be how many people have ever shied away from anything because i don't want to go to eight years of medical school I don't want to do 12 years of this or that, or I don't want to do four years of this. You don't look at the four years. You don't look at the year of faith that's going to take to get your body whole again. You only have to make it through today. And I've used that, and I share that. Stop looking at how many days I have to do this, how long it's going to take. How bad is your want to? I only have to get through today. I had that kidney stone back at the turn of the year. Let me tell you, that was the most painful thing I have ever went through in my life. But I made it. I made it. Waves of pain would come, and it's like, well, how much worse can it get? I got to the point, I said, if it gets any worse than this, I'm going to pass out, and then I'll be free. <laughs> Sometimes in a fight of faith, you feel like, it'd be, I'd just like to quit. Can I get a witness? I would just like to quit. I want you to know the fight is not just about you. It's not just about today. And you need to understand that, that the fight of faith is about next year and the next 10 years. It's worth fighting for. It's about your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids. So it's worth fighting for. It's not just about you. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, and my son Cole quoted this to me yesterday morning. He says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. Nobody likes to have a witness against you, but God wrote one down. He said, I call heaven and earth as a witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. You have a choice in this matter. Choose life so that you and your descendants can live. You make a qualified choice because it's more than about you. 
You ought to declare, I am not leaving here too early. I am not leaving here until my destiny is fulfilled. My kids are going to grow up with a mother and a father in a godly household, and I'm going to bless them the way God intended for me to bless them and get them up and established and through school, and I'm not leaving here early. Bless God. Paul said we have, I keep re repeating this, we have the same spirit of faith. You have it. You have the same spirit of faith. And one ingredient for maintaining that spirit of faith is a story taken from, I can only quote, I heard another, another preacher talk about this, and I can't tell you, I don't have a, a footnote that says it's legitimate, so if you can't find it, don't come back on me. I'll give you Mark Hankin's phone number, and you can call him, and you can bend his ear and say, where did you find that? But one ingredient for maintaining the spirit of faith comes from an example from one of Abraham Lincoln's memoirs. And in this little village, this little town where Abraham Lincoln grew up, there was a, uh, a little dog that could whip all the big dogs. This little, I uh, picture this little terrier, this little nasty wire-haired. There's no mastiff, no Great Dane that could take him down. You know, and some people think that your dog is an extension of you. You ever, so you ever seen those type of people? They got to have this big, tough dog, and, and, and nobody wants their dog to get whipped by another dog. It, nobody wants the neighbor's dog to whoop up on their dog because it, me, it means something. If my dog can beat your dog, then I can beat you. <laughs> you ever know that type of person? Absolutely, right? So this guy had this little dog that could whip all the big dogs. And they asked the guy, how come your little dog can whip all the big dogs. And the guy said, very simple. He said, the big dogs, they're not ready to fight until the fight's half over. He said, my little dog stays mad all the time. My little dog's got an attitude. My little dog stays mad all the time. So let's say it this way. If you're going to maintain a spirit of faith, come on now, if you're going to maintain this thing, You've got to get yourself stirred up, not halfway into the fight. You've got to get up in the morning with a stirred up attitude. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will be glad and I will rejoice in it. You need to stay mad. You said mad, pastor? Yep. You need to stay mad. You need to stay mad at the one who deserves to be mad at. Stop taking your anger out and your frustration out on people that were not designed to receive it. You need to chant, I said a few weeks ago, you, you, you can either stay mad, mad as hell at the devil. You've got all the right ingredients there. If you've had an anger problem, you've had an issue problem, you know, you're, you're equipped. You just need to point this thing in the right direction. Come on now, that's a good place to say amen. It's not the, I said, if God reveals what your problem is, you ought to rejoice and say, thank you, Jesus. I said a few weeks ago, I knew in my heart. You know something, something? I have had anger issues in my past. And when people walk in this door, I can tell by your countenance, I've seen that look on your face in the mirror in the morning. I know what it looks like. God's not trying to beat up, beat you up. He's trying to get you free. That's how I found out a lot of people in church don't want to be, they don't want help. They want to come here and I do the right thing and I'm on my way to heaven and we're good, God, you know. It, God wants you delivered. Faith Life Church is the deliverance church. That's a good place to say amen. So you need to stay mad, but you need to stay. You need to stop taking it out on people who love you, that have your best interest at heart, and you need to start pointing it where it belongs, right at the devil. We have the same spirit of faith, and right in the middle of that 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 same fight of faith, I want you to know that Paul was in a mess. Paul was in a mess in Acts chapter 27. He said to everybody, he's on this ship, and he says to everybody, the storm is raging. You know, Paul was shipwrecked. He said, everybody cheer up. Everybody get happy. Because I believe it shall be as he told me. And that's a paraphrase of, this is what it says in Acts 27, 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. You can learn something from that. Let's get happy. Be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as he told me. What has God told you? Maybe he didn't speak to you. Maybe he didn't, there wasn't an audible voice. But what has God shared from his word with you? It shall be even as he told me. Amen? So everybody cheer up, he says. I believe God. 
You know, when Paul said this, he was on day three of a 14-day storm, the book of Acts says. You know, when, Selena, when you're on day three of a 14-day storm, you don't know that it's day three of a 14-day storm. You don't know when this thing is going to end. And I, How many know that 14-day storms are not the norm? Any meteorologist here can confirm 14-day storms are, are not the norm. And he was in the middle of one. Paul's in the middle of a storm that everybody involved thought they were going to die. Not too many people here today can say that. You had some rough spots. How many of you have been on a ship in a storm and thought, this is it? We are not coming back. Paul said, everybody cheer up, I believe God. It shall be as he told me. Acts 27 and 24, he says, do not be afraid. Paul, this is what the spirit, the angel of God said to Paul. He says, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. I have a destiny for your life. You have an end place. There's a place that you need to get to. It would behoove you if you know what your destiny is. Because then every time the devil would try and tell you you're not going to make it, you say, no, I have a destiny. It doesn't matter what it looks like. I've heard my father and my father-in-law say, if you don't know where, if, if, how you go, if, how are you going to know where to go if you don't know where you're going? How do you know whether you're going the right way or not? How are you going to get there if you don't know where you're supposed to be? How are you going to make good choices, son, if you don't know where you're, you're endeavoring to be? Where there's no vision, people perish. Come on now, you've got to have a vision. You've got to have a plan for your life so you make good, qualified decisions. Where there's no vision, people, people perish. John, expand your vision. Your vision, your plan for God, God's plan in your heart for your life goes way beyond the circumstances that you're in right now, brother. God, forget what it looks like. You've stumbled into this church a few weeks ago. The spiritual leader in your life died a week later. I'm well aware. God is well aware. You are in the right place at the right time, brother. God has a plan for your life. And don't be afraid to get excited about that. It's okay. God is not going to let you down. They escaped the ship and they made it to an island. And it says when they got there, it says a snake bit Paul. You familiar? It says a snake came out of the fire and clamped a hold of, of Paul's hand. And people stared because they knew this was the black mamba, two steps. It's it, over and done. If this snake bites you, it's over, brother. It says that Paul shook the snake off. Most of us, if we had been in this situation, or I will admit, I, I would have thought, the minute this happens, little Lord, why am I having this storm? What are you trying to teach me? What does this storm mean? Why? Why am I in this storm? I thought you had a plan for my life, God, and I'm in the middle of this storm. Why, Lord? Why am I going this way? Why is this cancer attacking my body? Why is this disease come upon me? I thought you had a plan for me, Lord. Oh, Lord. Why, Lord, am I having a shipwreck? First, I'm in a storm. Now, I'm in a shipwreck. Survive the shipwreck, float to shore on a board. I get bit by a poisonous snake. Why, Lord? Wonder why I got bit by a snake. Trying to figure it all out. Why, Lord? What's going on? What are you trying to tell me? I'll tell you what he's trying to tell you. A snake don't belong on your hand. That's what God's trying to tell you. <laughs> he tells you what to do. He'd shake it off. Oh, Jesus, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for God to heal me. He didn't say, oh, Lord, I'm believing that this, this venom is not going to take my life. Like most of us. <laughs> Whoa, Jesus. Yeah, you know, in the back of the ambulance on the way to the hospital, hoping I make it. Oh, God, if you be for me. He is for you. Shake it off. He shook it into the fire. And I'll tell you what happened. Paul's turned a storm, a shipwreck, a snake bite into a healing revival. They looked at him. They thought he was going to die, Selena. And when he didn't, they thought as though he was a god. And then the next place he went, he went in, and I forget the guy's name, but his father was laying in bed with dysentery. It said a bloody flux, and I looked that up, and it's not very nice, and that's all I'll say about that. And he healed the man. And then they said they brought everybody else on the every. The Bible says everybody else on the island came to him that was sick and got healed. 
I, I said it wasn't going to turn us into a healing service, but I didn't do it. It's just there. You can't have the Word of God and be sick. The two do not go hand in hand. He turned it into a healing revival. I don't care what kind of trouble you're in. God is turning it around and turning it into some revival for your life. Amen? I've got one eye on the clock here where I've got to got to pick up the pace because i got other things I want to say. I know you're sitting there with this popcorn thinking, what does this have to do with popcorn? Has anybody thought that? What does this have to do with popcorn? Or have you forgotten about the popcorn? Did you notice that Paul said, everybody cheer up. I want you to know the first evidence that you have the spirit of faith, <laughs> you need to get happy. You need to, come on, everybody wants the spirit of faith because that's how we how, one, how we please God, and that's how we appropriate. You know, you're never using, we think that if I use faith, I'm going to get God to do something that he hasn't already done. You cannot get God to do anything that he hasn't already provided and done for you. You use your faith to appropriate what God has already done for you. It's available. That's it. Back to Google. It's free. What, 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 what if you, I need healing like four times in my lifetime? It's free. It's still free. Well, God, you know, I, I could use some finances, and, and well, it's free. It's already been provided. It's there for you. So the first evidence is, come on now, what? Well, cheer up. Many people, when they're in a fight of faith, and I've been there in the in past weeks, is, you know, it's, it's not a good time to be happy. I'm, I'm just in a fight of faith right now, and I've got to be serious. And that's not what the Word of God has said. We want to take this Word literally. We've got to do what it says. I don't have time for this, but I got to go there. I was listening to Andrew Womack. He lady came in. She'd been sick in her, her body for like eight years. They said her pain, if it one to ten for eight years, her pain has been a constant eleven. He said she had a coat with magnets and magnets taped to her body, trying to, to relieve her body of this pain. He says, and she was a Presbyterian woman, and I spent time and I prayed with her. How would you be going to Presbyterian church? I didn't say it. God did. She was a Presbyterian woman, and she didn't know the first thing about being healed and God's de de desire to heal our bodies. Andrew Womack prayed for her, and the heal and healing came. Left her body, and they sat there, and they talked, much like we would after service, and he just talked with her. And she says they was about to leave. It had been about half an hour. She said her hand hit the doorknob, and she turned around, and she looked at Andrew, and she said, the pain is he said, well, I've been teaching you for the past 30 minutes of how this thing works. He said, so now you, you, you pray and you, you take authority over this because Pastor John can't be with you every hour of the day, right? So she prays this prayer. Father, I believe that by the stripes of Jesus I was healed and this has no right in my body, this and that. And she finished and he said, is the pain still there? And she said, yes. He says, do you know why? And she said, no. He says, that wasn't a good prayer. He says, that was a pretty good prayer for somebody who had been Presbyterian 45 minutes ago. He says, but you didn't do what God told us to do. Mark eleven twenty two says what? Speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain and tell it to be cast. And she says, you mean I need to talk to pain like it's a person? He says, isn't that what Jesus told you to do? We have been praying in error. I know it's crazy, but let me tell you what. When you speak to pain and say, pain, in the name of Jesus, leave, it does. So she did exactly what he said. She said, he said, she got mad. The kingdom of heaven has suffered violence since the days of John the Baptist. And the Bible says that the violent take it by force. You got to be that mad little dog that just gets up and you're mad at the devil all the time. She said, pain in the name of Jesus. And she said, it's gone. She never even said leave. I can tell some of you don't accept that, but I'm telling you, I've been practicing it and it works. It is the truth. Are you able to believe, come on church, are you able to believe that it shall be as God said it would be in your life? Are you able to believe? Go ahead. If you are, go ahead and cheer up. 1 Peter 1.8 says, Yet believing, while you start believing, it says, Yet believing, you're, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. 
When you start believing, what's that mean? It means well, yet believing. When you start believing, it's time to get happy. Not, well, I'm still in this mess. My body's still in pain. These crazy kids haven't stopped doing what they're doing. And all these things are going on. No, yet believing, rejoice. It's time to get happy. If you're going to win the fight of faith, you need to rejoice. I said last week, if you knew what happened in the spirit, when you begin to rejoice, you'd rejoice every day. I had to rejoice yesterday. Symptoms going crazy in my body. And sometimes you've just got to say, ha, 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 I mean, I said, ha, 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 for three minutes, Fez, before I felt any ha, ha, ha going on on the inside of me. And then Julie's laying on the couch, and I said, does this bother you? I said, because I, sometimes I feel like I'm in this fight of faith, and I need the people, you know, that I'm not troubling the people around me. I said, ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. And then all of a sudden, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and then it hits you. See how it hits you? Sometimes you've got to do it on purpose. When you don't feel like doing it, you need to rejoice. I'm going to tell you, it's like a dog whistle to the devil. He can't stand it. You're worshiping God, and he's, he's wreaking havoc in your body, bringing pain and symptoms and things to you, and you're laughing, and you're rejoicing, and it says you resist the devil, James 4, 7. says submit to God, therefore resist the devil. And he'll do what? He'll flee. I tell him, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to leave. Exit the premises. Ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ho. God sits in the heavens and laughs. When God laughs, you don't even have to understand the joke. You just laugh out of respect. He's laughing, I'm going to laugh with him. James 1, 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, various trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work. How many know that before you get to patience, usually trials, you have a whole lot of other things that manifest? God said, count it. Count them up. Count it all joy. This means in the middle of a trial, what do you do? Count it joy. Count it up. The Berkeley translation, I love this. The Berkeley translation says, count it maximum joy. Maximum joy. In other words, when you're in a fight of faith, you need to turn your joy up. And you're going to have to do it on purpose. News flash. It just doesn't happen. You're not going to, I'm going to tell you what, when you are in diverse temptations and trials and tribulation, you are not going to feel like laughing. You are not going to feel like being happy. And that's when you need to do it more than ever. You need to do it on purpose. And if you can't find yourself in an attitude around some people that want to engage with you, and you call us up. You get your butt out to a women's meeting. You get yourself to the house of God, and we'll laugh with you. Come on now. Count them up. Count it all joy. Well, if you're gonna, you, your faith has a minimum, and your faith has a maximum. You've got a volume control. And you have, the, you have control of the volume. No one else. I can help you along. I like to think that I do, but ultimately, you get to decide how many joys you're going to have. So let's count them up. One joy would be smiling. Come on now. Come on, you, can all, you can all achieve one joy. Come on, Noel. One joy. There it is. Doesn't that feel good? Daddy, you can do it too. Come on. One joy. Come on. I'm going to get a spiritual tickle fight with you. One joy. I told you, you need to do this. Two joys would require some laughing. Three joys, some shouting. Four joys, jump around. I was standing in the Acme the other night. Cole used to bounce when he was a kid. He just could not. Well, he's still a kid, but when he was a little boy, he just a bump, 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 bump. And I am standing in the Acme, and symptoms are going in my body. And I'm, so he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm jumping. I'm jumping. I'm up to four joys. Five joys gets ugly. Five joys is when we do some dancing, right? We do some, some mummer time parade. Come on, Mark. We'll do some dancing. We'll do some shouting. We'll do some singing. We'll work ourselves up to dancing. Five joys would do some praise God. Hallelujah. I thank you that the word of God is true. Worship God. And then seven joys. And we know that seven is the number of completion. So if your lightning fast mind would figure out from some deductive reasoning, Seven joys must require doing it all at the same time. Maximum joy. All dialed up. 
Paul said in Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Pat, you get it. Pat already, she was one step ahead of me. You know, 16 times, 16 times in the book of Philippians, living in the most difficult time in his life, Paul said, Rejoice. Rejoice. I mean, no, he didn't feel like rejoicing. 16 times. Stormed on, shipwrecked, snake bit, beaten ahead, left for dead. And he was the guy that said in 2 Corinthians 2, 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always, always, say with me, always causes me to what? Triumph. Thanks be unto God, who always causes me to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Who causes us to triumph? God. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. I said earlier, God is the performer. You are the believer and the speaker. That's your place. Your place is to believe and to speak. And in the closing minutes of our service, here's an illustration of faith. Yes, Fez, your popcorn has now arrived. Anybody here, anybody here like popcorn? I know you're, you're taking one with you whether you like it or not. But who likes, I mean, you love popcorn, that's good. Who remembers when they, come on now, we're going to tell our age. Who remembers when they first came out with microwave popcorn? Yeah, I remember. General Mills obtained the first patent for a microwave bag of popcorn in 1981. Popcorn consumption increased drastically because of the advent of that little package your hand, you've got in your hand, Bobby. If you liked popcorn, this was something. This was cool. No more, we were talking yesterday at dinner with mom and dad. My mom, we had a big frying pan. We pour the oil in, and then we pour like an eighth a cup of corn. Or corn. I think it was an eighth cup, right? Eighth cup of popcorn. I remember me and Tina, we went nuts one time. You know, little kids don't understand that an eighth cup of popcorn was like this much when it pops. So we poured like, I don't know, half a cup of popcorn in that, and we had popcorn everywhere. We were panicking and, it would, you know, just take it off the heat, duh. When a 13-year-old kid is popping popcorn, and it's, you just, it was everywhere. Spewing over the burner. I wonder we didn't burn the kitchen down. No more shaking that Hot, that, that frying pan, and then how many of the hot air popper? That's a dumb thing. The advent of microwave popcorn. We've been delivered. We went to the, we come to the land flowing with milk and honey, Dick. My, microwave popcorn. How many have a microwave that has a popcorn setting on it now? I mean, that's how, come on, come on, who's got the popcorn set? You just hit popcorn and it, it takes off. But see, before you had that, you had to read the instructions on the bag. And it would say, you need to set this popcorn bag in the microwave and set the microwave up for three minutes and 45 seconds, four minutes at the, at the max, right? Three minutes and 45 seconds. You set the timer. You set the little bag, and you, you know, it depends. You've got to put the bag in the right way so that it expands and it does what it's supposed to do without flipping over and acting all silly. You put the bag in there, Mark. You set the timer on three minutes and 45 seconds, and then you look in the little window, Marie. Whirls around and around. Three minutes and 45 seconds, and you wait, and it looks like nothing's happening. set this in there and there's nothing going on microwave is turning one minute goes by nothing two minutes go by nothing you're approaching the three minute mark still nothing right about three minutes and five seconds you get the first pop. And you say, well, all right. Fez, we're going to watch some football. And, uh, you know, your bag comes out, my bag's going in, and we got our little studio tray set up, and we're getting ready. 
Fez has got the Turkey Hill out. We got popcorn going. Well, all right, I got a pop. A couple seconds go by. You get, I got two pops. Do you know in the last 30 seconds, you got popcorn insanity. That thing starts going pop, 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 pop. If you're like me, I, I like, I don't want to burn it, Pat. It starts slowing down. All of a sudden, that bag is full, and you don't even get up. It's just. I can get one more pop. Come on, there's got one more in there. I don't smell anything burning yet. It's going crazy. Because you thought nothing was going on, and now you can see it happening. You're looking in the little window. The bag is filling up. You can uh, aroma of popcorn. Can't get away with nothing. We, me and the Julie and the, kid, the kids, maybe we make popcorn. And Julie come home from work hours later. Like, you all made popcorn, didn't you? Yeah, we made popcorn. <laughs> Mouth watering. You can almost, you don't have any popcorn yet. But you can see it. You can smell it. You can almost taste it. You know, in those last 30 seconds, God pops the entire bag. How does this have anything to do with faith? God would say, never get discouraged. Listen to me. Never get discouraged when you have the switch of faith turned on and it looks like nothing's happening. Come on, just, Leo, come on up and start playing. And never. Come on now, you got the switch of faith turned on and it looks like nothing's happening, Noah. I got my confession right. I know what God says. I got the switch of faith turned on, and it looks like nothing is happening. You know, God will give you one pop. If you've ever had a pop, you know that it's working. You've, sp you've spoken to situations, symptoms in your body, and they've, they've it's changed. You've gotten a pop. God said it's working. Don't lose hope. You've got the switch of faith turned on. He said, don't worry. He said, I can pop. You've got a whole lot of unpopped corn in your bag. i got a way more in you than you've seen surface at this moment. What's this mean? It means don't get discouraged when in faith the first year it doesn't happen. Now we're, we're talking years now. In the second year, it hasn't happened. I've got the switch of faith turned on, and I've seen some pops. God says, I can pop your entire bag in the last few seconds and bring it all to pass. It shall come to pass. Why don't you laugh about that? The things that are most dear to your heart, what God placed inside of you, He will bring it to pass. Forget about what you haven't seen happen yet. Focus on the pops that you have seen because it's working. Smith Wigglesworth says, Faith laughs at impossibilities. You've got an impossible situation that you're up against. I would laugh about it. Ron. That's not a laughing matter. Yes, it is. I would laugh on purpose until the spirit of joy wells up on the inside of you. Pick three things in your life that seem impossible or pick one big one. But you really, this is the top of my list. And just laugh. You ever put a bag of popcorn in the microwave and it cycles through the whole four minutes and nothing happens? What's going on? You look over the microwave and somebody don't put it on you first. Dick's laughing. Marie! Marie, did you put the microwave on deep frost? Yes, honey! All right. What do we got to do? Turn that sucker back up on high. Turn it back up. If you haven't gotten a pop in a while, maybe somebody sets you on defrost. Maybe you've got to count up those joys and you've got to turn up your level because there's no devil in hell that can stay where the presence of God is. You've got the switch of faith turned on. I'm going to tell you, don't be moved. It doesn't look like it's working. And some of you have sh shared with me. I thought we'd have been further along by now than the place that we're at. I'm telling you, God's word is true. It shall come to pass. It's working. It is working.
Some of you don't even realize how far you've come. I don't want to, they're not here this morning, but I've called somebody out a few weeks ago. I said, it is working. You don't even see how far you've come in the short time that we have been in your life. God is changing you from the inside out. I am right on time, every time, all the time. You have to adjust your setting up on high. You need to get your believing turned up on high, your speaking turned up on high, and your praising up on high. Get it up to max joy. I'm just going to take some discipline, because I'm going to tell you, it doesn't feel good to do it. Some of you sitting here right now, and you believe what I'm saying, but I know when you leave up out of here, I know what my struggle is. Things come against me. Even with my own wife and kids. We left Riverwinds the other night. I said, honey, Cole, I said, daddy is under attack. I said, I bet you don't want to hear me worshiping and praising right now. He said, go right ahead, dad. Go right ahead. Whether he really wanted me to do it or not, I don't know. But you need to get yourself in a place. And that's, I'll go in that side room of mine and close the door if I feel like, you know, it, the devil's crazy. He'll wait till we're sitting down having family time. And he'll bring symptoms. You know, we're getting ready to watch a movie together. And, and Daddy's got to excuse himself. And I just quietly get up and I go, I go upstairs. I'll go into my side room and I'll close the door. You are in a fight. And it's not to be taken lightly. You need to turn your volume up to max joy. I want you to know, in the atmosphere of faith, things will start popping. Come on. Things will start popping. People will be healed. They have been healed. Healing is here. We're going to continue with that theme next week of healing. I want to couple healing with faith and faith and healing until God takes us in a new direction. You don't have to. I want this to be a liberating statement to you. You don't have to make it happen. It's free. It's free. Go to the Google counter. Go to the Google counter and just ask for anything you want. I have a yogurt, a banana. I know I look ridiculous, but how about I have a whole bunch of them? I'll take a whole bunch of them. That's ignorant. No, it's already been provided for you. This mentality that we're just poor beggars, you know, going to be limping in to, to glory, that's ridiculous. He says, you and I have talked about, you know, well, if it doesn't work, what if it doesn't work? Then you, you're going to be in the presence of God. You're going to stand in His presence and in His glory. You know, we stand in church and we sing hymns when we all get to heaven. And some doctor tell you you're on your way and now you're upset. You don't have to. Things in your life will come about. Corn will stop, start popping when you will just rejoice. Amen. Uncle Jake, I went over by 11 minutes. My, my darling wife, I'll turn this to service over you. Leo, continue to play just in case God wants to minister and deal with some people, but I, I hope the things that we've been teaching you, we are equipping you to be people of faith, to not be pitiful, to be powerful. The presence of God is living on the inside of you. Healing is here. Healing is now. God's, God's word of faith works right where you're at. See what you can miss it. Amen. Amen. And I just want to sing, How Great Is Our God, as we need